when I got to Hollywood, I always thought my voice was very very high up there. And I couldn't play heavy because I was talking up there. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 it's a pivotal scene. You're going to be in the trailer. And I said, I said to Kasdan, I said, Larry, he says, the trailer will be in a month, a year and a half. How do you know what's going to be in the trailer? He says, trust me, it's a pivotal scene that will be in the trailer. When you find yourself in a fight with such viciousness, hit first if you can. And when you do hit, hit to kill. Growing up in Brooklyn, you called it guns when you went out to play. I grew up in Florida and we called it cowboys. We were playing cowboys. So that's the difference, I guess, between New York. Now, growing up in Brooklyn, uh, what was it like playing guns or cowboys, as I'd like to think it really was? Well, I mean, I, I was always fascinated by, you know, one would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would say, until the fourth grade when I decided that I wanted to be an actor, I would always say, a cowboy. Now, now you watch shows like Yellowstone, and you see how tough that yeah. cowboy life is. And you and I have gone riding with so many real ranchers, and their life is rough. I mean, getting up five in the morning, sleeping in a little bunkhouse, and going to bed at seven or eight, and you know, yeah, it's a tough life. So, it being an actor as a cowboy. Well, is a lot more, I personally think. <laughs> Do you remember the time at the hole in the wall where we all went at six in the morning to gather the steers that were, you know, had, had gotten loose high on the hill and it was six in the morning and it was really warm. And Bruce Boxleiter and I, and you know, we, we just put a duster and a shirt on like this because it was yeah. warm. By the time within three hours, we had gotten so far up the, up the mountain it was freezing and we, our hands were completely mm -hmm. numb and we couldn't even button our coats. It was so cold and thank God we came. I, I remember that story. We, we found a man who was a sheep herder and he took us back to his cabin and his wife made like 20 of us coffee. She had probably hadn't seen anybody in months and she was so happy to see you. And we're wearing these long dusters. We looked like something right out of Sergio Leone, you know, especially there were so many of us. Yeah, Bruce said that there was a little kid in his, his toy. He was playing gnawing on a piece of wood or something. I mean, that's desolate. That's hard work. That's hard, hard work. Hard work. In the Westerns, I know you played one of the screen's most memorable villains, Crease, and you have such a huge fan base, and it's always been like that since I've known you, that in the bad guys in movies then. Do you have an affinity for playing bad guys? I know you've played some of the best in Wyatt Earp, Kevin's movie. You are so mean. It's not a big part, but it's very memorable. You're even in the trailer for the movie. How did that come about? I was friendly with Kevin and I, it's when we met when they were working on the project as Dan Gordon was doing it. It was going to be three, two hours for cable television. And I would stop by the studio and chat with him about Westerns, and he was a great guy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he just he loves Westerns. He turns every movie he does into a Western, whether it's <laughs> The Postman or Waterworld. Yeah. It yeah. all becomes a Western one way or another. And, you know, we have that much in common. And, and we just talked about everything, you know, all, all the different genre movies. that, But primarily Searchers, The Wild Bunch, all that conversation always ended up like that. I had to read for it, and uh, I didn't really want to do it. I wanted to play Virgil Earp, which was Michael Madsen, <laughs> you know, and I get a call from Larry Kasdan, and he says, Marty, directly, he says, Marty, I want you to play this role. It's a pivotal role. And, you know, you, 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 you um, transition him into the legend within that scene that you did in the in the saloon when he, he takes my rig and wears it for the rest of the movie mm -hmm. and i said but I, I it's a very small part i really wanted to do and i was doing Cagney and lacy and i was doing some really interesting things and and he said no no no, it's a pivotal scene you're going to be in the trailer <laughs> and i said i said to kasdan i said Get larry he says the trailer will be in a month a year and a half how do you know what's going to be in the trailer he says trust me it's a pivotal scene it'll be in the trailer 
So I said, okay, we'll do it. And sure enough, a year and a half later, it was in the trailer. When you find yourself in a fight with such viciousness, hit first if you can. And when you do hit, hit to kill. Boom. The scene, you know, was pretty funny because, you know, he just knocks me out and but with a cue ball and takes my, my gun <laughs> and holds it up. And I, I actually, when I left that set, I had such a good time. I, I was there for a week and I came with my camcorder to shoot things. I came three days early because I wanted to be on the set just to absorb the energy. And, um, you know, when I left, I cried. I just mm -hmm. didn't want to go. I just, Santa Fe, Kevin, Larry, the West, it was sad to go. Yeah, we, I was right near, the, right near the town that they, Silverado was literally up the road. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we shot in a tent city that would have been somewhat like Deadwood, you know, circa 1869 before, before Wyatt Earp becomes Wyatt Earp and feels his power and all that. That was the pivotal scene. It's a great, great movie still, I think, and it's so different from Tombstone that came out six months earlier. Tombstone was not expected to be the huge hit that it became and uh, a, a true classic, but I would have loved to have seen, and in fact, I still would, to see a longer cut of Wyatt Earp Kasdan's movie uh, re-edited like Quentin does. Quentin re-edited uh, Hateful Eight, into a miniseries and added these other scenes that he filmed and he's, I think he's going to do the same thing with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. To me, you're getting a double bang for your buck. Those are really wonderful films and the texture maybe deserves a longer running time. To sit for it in one long movie like White Earp was, people said, oh, it's just too long. But if you break it up in, as a miniseries, I think it would be fantastic. Nothing counts so much as blood. The rest are just strangers. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other bad guys in Westerns. Well, Lee Van Cleef in The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, he, he, at the beginning, he's just eating out of, you know, he's eating out of the wooden bowl and all, and then he kills that fellow, you know, <laughs> trying to find, you know, he just kills everybody, the woman, the, the son. And then Henry Fonda, of course, mm -hmm. in Once Upon a Time in the West. You know, I mean, Frank, you can't get worse than Frank, you know. He, <laughs> I mean, he, he and, all, and Fonda had never played a a villain. I mean, he just played the, you know, Grapes of Wrath character, you know, all mm -hmm. the way through his career. Well, he showed up on set with a big mustache because he wanted to look like a bad guy. And Leone goes, no, 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 no. We want to see those baby blues and had him take the mustache off. And, and Leone was right. He wanted the all-American hero from decades and decades to be Frank, the baddest badass there was. Well, I mean, Sergio, you know, when I met Sergio Leone, I mean, I, I I was tingling all over, and you know, I met him in a hotel and we chatted about his westerns, and it was in the Cannes Film Festival, and I knew a lot about, you know, his westerns, and and his brother-in-law was there because Sergio didn't speak very, he didn't speak English very well, and his brother would translate everything, and I asked him questions like, was the cigar your idea? Was the serape your idea? And he would tell me a couple of things and I knew so much six months later he was casting once upon a time in in America and I learned in Italian in perfect Italian do you remember me we met in Cannes <laughs> and then when I met him I said that to him and in in perfect English he says to me do I remember you you're the boy who knows more about my westerns than me <laughs> and you still do <laughs> At the beginning of, of Once Upon a Time in the West, just those three characters with Woody Strode, Jack Elam, just the essence of them was terrific. They're not my favorites because probably Lee Van Cleef could be my favorite and Jack Palance together, but Lee Van Cleef 
had also a joie de vivre when he played his characters. It wasn't all dark, you know. And I really enjoyed, I enjoyed him in the early days when I saw him in Gunfight OK Corral at the beginning when he's when one of the three men were coming in. And, and you know, he, he reminded me of a lot of my career, taking so many small parts and making them really exciting to watch. When I did Gunsmoke, we were dying for more dialogue, and there James Arness was pulling away the pages and throwing them away. Ah, uh, Festus will say this. Ah, uh, Duck will say this. Amanda will say this. He didn't want to speak. And here we were, Paul Kozla, myself, and we're all saying, give us the dialogue. Give us a couple <laughs> of lines, you know? You're just desperate. In High Noon, you know, Lee Van Cleef is in that film, and his... Uh presence is so strong he's got the 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 two holsters crossing each other it's such a great look he's tall he's walking around. he has no lines he doesn't say one word in that film yet his presence is so memorable in that amazing amazing actor it's like woody strode i mean in, you can see him when he comes in with gifts for the pharaoh circa was it 1955 he has no lines you know, eventually he ended up doing Spartacus a couple of years later, but he, you, you just lock in. There are some people you just lock into because they have that charisma, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whether they talk or not. It's, but Lee Van Cleef was always interesting. I did a silent version called The Good, The Bad, and The Nasty, which was for English television, and it was wonderful. And we did it at Paramount Ranch, and I brought my own ghetto blaster with the soundtrack because these... <laughs> These were English, you know, English filmmakers, and they just, they didn't know it like I knew, knew it. And to have the final shootout, I played the soundtrack because we shot it at MOS. So I cranked up my ghetto blaster <laughs> and I played the soundtrack of, of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And I played the soundtrack at the end with the trumpets going, you know, that wonderful trilogy that he, Ennio Morricone wrote. And, you know, it was fantastic. And I played the Lee Van Cleef role. I'm all in black. I still have... I think I still have the frock coat from 1984, you know. <laughs> you are the king of Western <laughs> No question about it. There isn't anybody alive, including the people who've directed these movies, who know more than you, bro. Well, there's a lot of fans and a lot of people out there watching this show right now who are as much in love with the Western genre as we are, which is great. And I think that's one of the reasons this show is working so well. And I, I appreciate you coming on to talk to me as my test case in the Zoom interview, Marty. If you don't subscribe to a word on Westerns, you're going to have to recite that mercy is for the weak here and on the streets. Somebody confronts you, he is the enemy. Even while you're watching the word on Westerns, and the enemy deserves no mercy. <laughs>